welcome to Deerfield United Methodist Church, where we are committed to loving Jesus and loving others. My name is Joanna Besky, and I am the pastor here. Come, let us turn to the holy. We come to worship our God, our creator. Come, bring your hopes and fears and longings for a better world. We come to praise the Prince of Peace. Come as your whole self, body, mind, and soul. We come to receive the Spirit who gives us life. God, as we attend to you, fill us with your peace. Amen. Let's join together now in singing the hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Testament reading is from Isaiah 2 verses 2 through 5. In the last days the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Our gospel reading is from John 14, verses 25 through 27. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There is a scene in a Sandra Bullock movie which came out in 2000. Um, I think the movie's called Miss Congeniality. And in that scene, all the Miss USA pageant um, contestants are standing on the stage and they're asked this question, what matters most to you? And one after the other after the other says with a big smile, world peace 
and the crowds go wild. And then we get to Sandra Bullock's character and her response is stricter, stricter laws for parole violation. It's silent. And as she looks around, she puts her smile back on and says, and world peace. And the, and the crowds go wild. <laughs> if only it was that easy, putting on a pretty dress and saying the world, words world peace and all conflicts would cease. We can't do that in our own world. We can't do that in our nation. And sometimes we can't even do that around our dining room table. Russia attacked the Ukraine back in February and the death toll rises and there's no sign of anything changing or this conflict ending. The Taliban returned to power in Afghanistan just last year and we don't even want to speak out loud the atrocities that are still happening to women and children there. A little closer to home just uh, in the last two weeks, uh, a shooter opened fire at a Walmart in Virginia killing five. And that was just a few days after an attack at a club in Colorado Springs, which killed five and injured 18. And then about a week before that, um, after that, sorry, a shooting at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, which left three dead. Did you know that there are more than 600 mass shootings a year? 600, that's like two to four a week. And it doesn't seem to be slowing down. A little closer to home, it can feel like even for us, that peace is far off. The holidays, as, a, as wonderful as Hallmark wants us to believe they are, can actually fuel tensions in our families. Finances are stretched more than ever that more than they've ever been, leaving financial peace as a dream more than a reality. And more of us than ever are facing Christmas with our share of grief. All of this happening while songs that speak of peace on earth, goodwill to all are being piped through the buildings wherever we go. The prophet Isaiah's world was also chaotic, unjust, broken, hurting a warring world. Events were out of control and fear was running rampant. The people were waiting for God to reveal a word concerning their situation. And into that turmoil and storm-tossed world, one voice stood out, the voice of Isaiah, speaking a word of hope, a word of peace. Our text begins with the divine revelation, the sure promise that the one true God who rules the world would bring peace. Isaiah saw a mountain, the mountain of the Lord's temple raised above the hills. So this is in reference to Mount Zion upon which the temple was built and the place where God dwelt in Israel's history. In Revelation, we also see Mount Zion as a place in heaven where we will all dwell together one day. God shows Isaiah that sometime in the future, God will raise up that temple and that mountain on which it stands. And it says, and all nations will stream to it. He speaks of people from every nation, inviting each other to join the pilgrimage to the place where the God of Israel dwells. One way that we partner in, with God in ushering peace is through our witness as we extend invitations to others to join in that pilgrimage, the journey of faith upon which we ourselves are journeying. For some, it's a literal invitation to, to come to church or to Bible study. Uh, for others, it's just the simple act of coming alongside someone, being present in their lives, in their times of chaos and conflict and, and inviting them to witness our walk with Christ and together moving towards God's holy mountain. Isaiah goes on to speak of how God will judge between the nations and will settle disputes among the peoples. In essence, through God's divine justice, we will experience real peace. 
When reading scripture, sometimes a word will jump out to you as if to say, pay attention to this word. In this word, that in this verse, that word for me was between. When you think of two people, or in this case, two nations fighting, they fight face to face. Can you picture it? I have a friend with two small girls, ages four and five, and they share a room. These two argue over everything, clothing and toys and shoes and food, everything. They're little girls, but their lungs are strong. I've watched as my friend has gone in during a time of conflict between her girls and uh, she'll stand between them. And then she'll raise out her arms, reach out her arms. She'll ask them questions and they'll talk back and forth until the problem is resolved or well, at least for that moment. And then she brings them in and she talks to the girls about saying, I'm sorry to one another. And then they all go in for the big hug. This is what God does for us. A people who are far from God with no way to bridge the, the gap between us and them. He sends his son to stand between us, stretching out his arms to die on the cross, becoming the bridge necessary for us to live at peace with God forever. What if we carry this image with us when, when we're in conflict with someone? I wonder how would it change our viewpoint if we imagine Jesus standing between us? Perhaps it's a spouse or a family member or a, a work colleague. Imagine Jesus standing between you in that moment of conflict, reconciling you to each other. Ephesians 2 says that Jesus has broken down the dividing wall, the wall of hostility, bringing us together, reconciling us together and making us one. What a beautiful picture that is of unity and peace. As we pray for people in conflict, nations at war, and those for whom peace is but a dream, let us pray as if Jesus was right there, standing between them, settling disputes, and bringing them his peace. Isaiah tells us that God's peace enters, when God's peace enters a situation, the tools of destruction are reformed into instruments of nurture and growth. It says they will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. One scholar rephrased Isaiah's imagery this way. He says, the day will come when howitzer tanks will be converted into John Deere tractors to plow the fields. Guns will be used to build the fences upon which vines grow will turn missile silos into wheat silos and the Pentagon into the world's largest food court. Pedro Reyes is an artist who lives in Mexico City and he's known for transforming lethal weapons into things of beauty. I encourage you to look him up. There were just so many different art exhibits that they're just so powerful. And uh, in 2008, he created an, a project called Pistols to Shovels. And in this project, he melted down 1,527 pistols. And with that, he made 1,527 shovels in order to plant 1,527 trees. Reyes says that his transformational art isn't an expression or protest. It's an expression of hope and peace. He's literally hammering swords into plowshares. Isaiah uh, indicates that unlearning the arts of war will be among the first effects of people drawn to God's holy mountain. When we learn God's ways, we unlearn the ways of war and conflict. When we learn God's ways, we unlearn the ways of war and conflict. The one follows the other like hearing thunder after seeing lightning. When we walk in God's light, 
We leave behind the shadowy regions where conflict and, conflict and war live and make our way to the mountain of the Lord. So what are the weapons that we have that we use to destroy peace, to build walls, to create conflict? And how can we turn those to instruments of peace? I think in our relationships, probably the biggest one would be uh, our words. Proverbs tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue. I can think back to several conversations in my life that I wish I had handled better. And if I'm honest, I don't have to look back that far. What if we were able to freeze that moment and as we are about to hurl those words that sting, we could take the spear of words and transform it into a gift of blessing and peace. Ruby Bridges was a little six-year-old who was one of the first African-American children integrated into the New Orleans public school system. Every school federal march, uh, marshals would escort Ruby through the lines of angry parents hurling insults, racial slurs, and violent words. And then the same thing happened every afternoon when school got out. This went on for weeks and then months until every family had withdrawn their children from school. So Ruby went to school all by herself for the better part of that semester. The situation caught the attention of a Harvard child psychologist, Robert Coles. And Robert Coles went to the school and he began to interview uh, teachers and spend time with Ruby and her parents. And interviewing this teacher, uh, uh, they asked how she thought Ruby tolerated such continual adversity and abuse. And this is what the teacher said. Teacher said, I was standing in the classroom looking out the window and I saw Ruby coming down the street with the federal marshals on both sides of her. The crowd was there shouting as usual. One woman actually spat at Ruby's feet. Ruby turned and smiled at her. A man shook his fist at her. Ruby turned and smiled at him. And then she walked up the steps and stopped. She turned around and she smiled to all who were there one more time. She did the same thing when she left. You know what she told one of the marshals who escorted her? She said that she prays for those people, the ones in the mob. She prays for them every night before going to sleep. In a hopelessly hostile world, we need to hear again God's promise of peace. Advent is a time to reflect on the coming of the Prince of Peace. Advent is about dreams and visions, the, the dream of, of God for this world and how God's dream comes true in flesh and blood in a child who was born to us, Jesus, and in and through the church, Christ's body present to this world, this broken, warring world. So stay awake, be alert, and be ready, for God is on the way. That is what Advent is all about. Come, it is time to live in the light of God. This Advent, let us celebrate the gift that Jesus gives to all of us, a gift that lasts not just for one night, but for all eternity, a gift we are called to share with all, a gift from himself to his disciples, his followers. Peace, I leave you, he says, my peace I give you. And I, I do not give to you as the world gives. You see, his peace is an invitation to all people, tribes, and nations to journey to his holy mountain and dwell with the Father for all eternity. His peace breaks down dividing walls and makes us one. His peace turns weapons for destruction into tools for repairing and building up. His peace bridges the gap between a broken people and a gracious God, and his peace is available to all. I want to close with a prayer of Francis of Assisi. He was a Catholic friar in the uh, 13th century. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. 
where there is doubt, faith, where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us as this Advent season, we begin by focusing on peace made possible through Jesus Christ. I want to invite you, if you are local and have small children, to join us on December 10th. Uh, Santa will be in his workshop at our social hall, and we will have refreshments, and there will be story time, and uh, lots of other things that's happening from one to three. We've got some other services uh, happening in the month of December. We will have a service on December 21st. Uh, it's called a service of solace. And this is an opportunity for those for whom Christmas is a difficult time. We've experienced loss, perhaps death, of friends and family members. For us to come together, remember them, and to receive healing and peace from our Father. Christmas Eve, we will have a service at 7 p.m. And yes, Christmas morning, which is a Sunday, we will have a service at our regular 9.30 time. To find out more, please check out our church website, DeerfieldUMCNJ.org, and click on the events and meetings. God bless you, and may his peace lead you, fill you, and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.